We see Israel's continual sin and eventual captivity. We see God's continuing love for Israel. We hear God's charge against Ephraim, and we begin the last book in the Bible, the book of Revelation, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Today on 3 in 1, as we consider Hosea chapters 10 through 12 and Revelation chapter 1. There were so many gut-wrenching verses in today's reading concerning Yes, the sin and coming captivity of Israel, but also the continuing love that the, the Lord had for Israel, even while Israel was so bent on sin and rebellion. Like verse 12 of chapter 10, where God said, Sow for yourselves righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord till he comes and rains righteousness on you. Man. Now, we've seen through our time through the scriptures that God has, in an attempt to convey his emotion, he's used human relationships as analogies. He's often used the human relationship of a husband and a wife to try and describe the the pain of his people choosing to be unfaithful to him, even after all that he's done for them, even after all that he's doing for them. He uses this human relationship of a husband and wife and unfaithfulness between a husband and wife to try and convey the pain that he feels, to try and convey that pain to his own people, to his own people that are being unfaithful to him. Now, in our reading today, God used another human relationship. God used the relationship between a parent and a child to try and describe the pain that he feels. Like in verse 7 of chapter 11, where he said, My people are bent on backsliding from me. Though they call to the Most High, none at all exalt him. How can I give you up, Ephraim? How can I hand you over, Israel? How can I make you like Adma? How can I set you like Zeboim? My heart churns within me. My sympathy is stirred. Now, I'm not sure why... This always startles me to see God have such real and raw emotion. And maybe it's because I make the mistake still, still of of assuming that omnipotence would somehow make God aloof or apathetic. You know, because, you know, when's the last time any of us have ever lamented over the waywardness of a a bunch of ants, you know? And, And yet God is so much more powerful than than us over ants, you know, and he still, he still cares for us. He still cares for us so much so that his heart really does break when we're bent on backsliding. Now, at this point, if, if God was only an almighty despot, he would just crush us and move on with his day. But that's not who God is. God loves us. God loves his people and he loves us more than any mom has ever loved a daughter or any father has ever loved his son. And I wonder, does that help you in understanding how much God loves you? God loves you more than any parent has ever loved their child. And you parents know how much you love your children, and yet God loves you more. And you parents know that the pain is often involved in parenting because of this awful and awesome thing that we all have. It's called free will. Our children, our children have wills of their own. Some of our children have strong wills that are bent on sin and rebellion. Some of our children have weak wills that are easily influenced into sin and rebellion. And that can be gut-wrenching and and terrifying as a parent. You you do the best you can to serve and protect and provide and guide and and in the hopes, the hopes that one day you can pass on that baton and, and hope that they do well, hope that they make good choices, hope that they honor God with their lives. But what do you do? How do you feel when, when you've done all of that, when you've done your best to provide all of that, and then your children as autonomous adults choose to be bent on sin and rebellion, bent on backsliding. Well, then, you know, your heart just can't help but break. But break just like God's heart breaks. And and you scan 
the skies, waiting, wondering if your wayward child will ever return like the, the prodigal's father, like the parable of the prodigal, when Jesus again was attempting to convey the affection and the emotion and the care and the compassion of his father toward us. And in that situation, there's this continual prayer offered up to God that our children would eventually come back to their senses, that they would eventually come back to God, that they would heed the tender fatherly encouragement that we read today in Hosea 12, 6, where God said, So you, by the help of your God, return, observe mercy and justice, and wait on your God continually. Okay, in addition to our intense time in the book of Hosea, we also began the last book in the Bible today, the book of Revelation. Now, what an adventure it's been uh, during our time in three in one in the last 11 months. We, we worked our way through some incredible material in our endeavor, in our never-ending adventure of knowing and enjoying God. And as we enter into the book of Revelation, know this, guys, we're just getting warmed up. <laughs> The book of Revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show his servants the things that are about to take place, the things that are rapidly approaching. Listen once again to what you read today. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, to all things that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. So, we learned a few things from the initial verses in the book of Revelation. One thing that we learned is that this is not the book of Revelations. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him. Did you notice that? It's the revelation that God the Father gave to God the Son. Now, why is that? Well, Jesus said something interesting in Mark chapter 13. Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. So that means that there had to come a time where the Father would fill in the Son. <laughs> and this, what we're reading, it's a recording of the communication between God the Father and God the Son. Listen again to those first two verses. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants the things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, to all things that he saw. See, the Father and the Son were communicating and John was watching. Now, now think about our forms of communication and their limitations. You know, we have written communication, verbal communication, nonverbal communication, but think about the lack of limitations in communication between the father and the son. Think about how the father would communicate the content contained within this revelation, the revelation of Jesus Christ. He would communicate it in sweeping landscapes and panoramas. And then John would be in the middle, in the midst, trying desperately to just write it all down, to write down what he, what he saw. And so John gives us what he saw. And he also gives us a specific promise from the Holy Spirit in verse three, where he said, blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it for the time is near. And so here is a specific blessing for those who read this book, those who hear this book, those who heed this book. 
by keeping those things which are written in it. For the, the time is near. A threefold blessing. Those who read the book, those who hear the book, those who heed the book, by keeping those things which are written in it. See, the time is approaching. The day is approaching rapidly. The day of the Lord, the period of time of which the scripture speaks about more than any other period in all of human history. Yes, this is yet future for us, but it's right around the corner for us as well. The time is near. So the day of the Lord, what is it? Well, it's otherwise known as the tribulation or the time of Jacob's trouble. It's a specific seven-year period immediately preceding the second coming of Christ. It's the time of tribulation. You could, you could see it as a time of transition right before the kingdom of God is birthed onto the earth. And Jesus said it would be worse. It will be worse than anything the world has ever seen or ever will see. And it's the events of this intense period of time, this time of transition that are outlined for us in the book of Revelation, birthing in the rule and reign of Jesus Christ, revealing Jesus Christ. Now, our outline for the entire book was found in verse 19 of chapter 1. Jesus was speaking to John and he said, Write the things which you have seen, and the things which are, and the things which will take place after this. So these are our three divisions of the entire book of Revelation. One is the things which you have seen. That's chapter one. Then the things which are. That's chapters two and three. And then the things which will take place after this. Those are chapters four through 22. And it may sound simplistic, but it's very significant for a number of reasons. And we'll see that as we work our way through the book. The things which he had seen were found in chapter 1, and, and it's a description of the glorified Christ. And then there were the things which are, that's present day. Those are found in the seven letters to seven churches, and we'll read those in chapters 2 and 3. And then there are the things which will take place after this. Those are the events included within the day of the Lord, the time of tribulation, and onward. And those are found in chapters 4 through 22. The tribulation itself specifically is found in chapters 4 through 16. And then we get some bonus material, the things that will happen after that in chapters 17 through 22. And so all of this is to reveal to us Jesus Christ. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ, the King of kings, the, the Lord of lords, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, and the Lamb of God, the glorified Jesus in all of his awe and majesty, delivering a message to John to deliver to us. And, and part of that message, as we'll see in the next coming days, is seven letters to seven churches. In verse 10, we read this today, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet, saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, what you see right in a book, and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. And so some of this was to go specifically to each of these seven churches, and then all of this was to go generally to the entire church. And we'll read those little letters in the days to come. But before we go today, let's reread John's reaction to the glorified Christ, found in verses 12 through 18 of Revelation chapter 1. Listen. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet and girded about the chest with a golden band, his head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. And when I saw him, I, 
I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen.